Good afternoon. Welcome to Inspiring Change, reflecting on community-engaged design, led by members of IA's Collective of Publicly Engaged Designers. This session is part of Imagine America's 2021 National Gathering, The Shape of Us, Waterways and Movements. My name is Mina Matlin, and I serve as the Managing Director of Imagine America. I'm joining this virtual space from the homelands of the Nisanan, Maidu, Miwok, and Miwok, in a gathering place now known as the city of Sacramento. Over the two days of this convening and throughout the year, the Imagine America community comes together to learn and strategize on ways to build knowledge and inspire collective imagination around better ways of living, learning, and working together. Today's presenters address this call within the context of engaged design. So before introducing our presenters, I have a few logistical items to cover. First, you'll have opportunities throughout the session to meet and interact with our presenters and other participants. To begin, we invite you to use the chat to introduce yourself and where you're joining us from. Second, we invite you to engage with us on social media. Our event hashtag is IAGathering2021. It's now my pleasure to introduce Malika Bose and Brett Snyder, co-chairs of the Collective of Publicly Engaged Designers. Malika Bose is Professor of Landscape Architecture and Associate Dean for Research, Creative Activity, and Graduate Studies with the College of Arts and Architecture at Penn State. In addition to serving as co-chair of COPED, she is a member of IA's National Advisory Board. Brett Snyder is Associate Professor of Design at UC Davis and a partner of Chang and Snyder but is also a member of IA's Regional Advisory Council. Thank you to Malika and Brett for being here. And I now turn the space over to you. Thank you so much, Mina. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to, um, to welcome everyone. And um, I will just kick off by introducing our panelists who I'm really thrilled um, uh, that they're here and they are all really doing engaged work really meaningful engaged work, uh, as well as advocacy in a variety of ways. So um, just to introduce our panelists, um, first we have Tessa Cruz, who's the program manager. Actually, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Um, do you have any more of that? Um, any more? Can you read it all? Um, sorry, say that again. And, uh, I think me... this one is, so you can just share screen. Okay. Um, here we go. All right. So uh, again, I'm thrilled to introduce our guests. First, we have uh, Tessa Cruz, who is the program manager for equitable engagement and community engaged design at ICED based in Oakland, California. Uh, she's also the Director of Outreach and Engagement at Streetwise, which if you're not familiar, I would encourage you to take a look. Um, she has over seven years experience developing and implementing community facing geospatial tech platforms using no local knowledge to help underrepresented and vulnerable populations find resources and take action on important issues in their communities. Um, we also have Mark Gardner here, who is a principal of NYC based Jack Litch Gardner Architects, an award-winning design practice and studio that works across scales uh, from product design to interiors to buildings. He currently teaches architecture at Parsons in the School of Constructed Environments. Uh, he's also on numerous advisory boards, including Math Minds, as well as the New York chapter of the National Organization of Minority Architects. Uh, we also have Jennifer Lewis, the Director of the Center for Community Design and Preservation, uh, the Public Service and Outreach Arm of the University of Georgia's College of Environment and Design. Uh, she develops and promotes community engagement, service learning, and collaborative partnerships for the benefit of students, faculty, and the people of Georgia. Uh, and then finally, we have Biz Zhang, a designer, visual artist, organizer, and educator based on Tongva land in LA, California. They are a founding member of Space Industries, an organizer with the Design as Protest Collective and Dark Matter University, and is also a fellow at the University of Southern California School of Architecture. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to welcome you all, and uh, 
I think Malika will give a little bit of background on COPED and then kick off uh, the conversation. Thank you, Brett. Um, so um, just a little brief introduction to COPED, which is the collective of publicly engaged designers. We see this as a platform for designers and planners to share resources and best practices around publicly engaged design. Our aspiration is that COPED will become the go-to place for activists, scholars, creative practitioners working in the realm of publicly engaged or AKA community engaged design and planning. COPED was created to ensure that designers are an integral part of the IA community. And since 2018, Brett and I have been working with an amazing group of students, both at UC Davis and at Penn State to create resources that can be used by publicly engaged designers and developing COPED as a platform for discussing and deliberating on the practice and theory of community engaged design and planning. Mm. We really would like to leverage COPED to bring visibility to the ongoing work of publicly engaged designers and planners. So in 2019, we began with case studies of a variety of publicly engaged projects. And in 2020, during the first year of the pandemic, we explored what it means to be engaged in place during the twin pandemics of racial injustices and COVID-19. So in that kind of trajectory, we are really excited to have this panel discussion on inspiring change. So just a few things during this panel, we will first have a kind of free flowing discussion and conversation amongst the panelists on three questions that we had posed to them before. And we will show those uh, in the chat as well as have it uh, on the screen share for some time. And I invite the other participants in uh, this community that we have here, the Zoom community, if you have any questions or thoughts to put them on the chat and we will be um, kind of collecting them. And to also to let, to know, uh, let everybody know that we will have the opportunity of a breakout session where we can have, we we'll again have the chance to bring to the forefront uh, the thoughts and have a discussion between the panelists and the others in the audience. So with that brief, um, brief, brief description, sorry about that, I'd like to um, invite the panelists to have a conversation and we will start with the first question and which is what are the takeaways from the techniques that you have used engaging participants in planning design projects during the pandemic? So we're gonna have it more as a free flowing. So anybody in the, uh, of the panelists who wants to start the conversation, please go ahead uh, and respond to this question. Oh, I'm, I'm just going to jump in. I'm just going to jump in. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the, uh, you know, one of the things I'll, I'll talk about the, I mean, just very quickly, the convergence of my practice and, and teaching. Um, the, some of the things I was doing in my practice, I strangely enough found that I wasn't really engaging enough in my teaching. Um, and by that, I mean that in my practice, I've really got into um, community engagement, um, working with the, one of the projects I'm doing, Brett knows it as a, a, a bee center in, in Tanzania for the study of the African bee. And it's, it's not really about bees, it's about people and a cooperative of beekeepers, mostly women who are, you know, let the bees do the work and we make the money kind of thing. Um, and, you know, I went on a whole community engagement, met with different like, you know, village groups, tribal groups, all in the cooperative, all trying to, you know, so I'm doing this really intense community engagement. And then I get back to school and I find that I'm just sort of, I found that I was just sort of like, okay, now we're going to do this project. That's just, you know, it was kind of like boring, you know, um, what I ended up doing was during the pandemic, I teach a design build studio. And so perfect place for community engagement. That's what we're doing. Right. So um, but during the pandemic, one of the things we found was we couldn't build. 
And so I teach this with Dr. Sharon Sutton. Um, we really focused on um, community engagement. The last two projects during the time of the pandemic have focused on working with black urban farmers um, and uh, low income communities that are food deserts that are that are black. Um, one being in Crown Heights, Weeksville and in Brooklyn and the other being in Atlanta. We're in the pandemic, we can kind of work anywhere through this. Um, and so we found ways to actually engage community. The, the other one was in Atlanta on the south side uh, of Atlanta um, and with two brothers who had purchased land, two brothers that were farming. And we found that we could really do very intense community engagement and focus on that and actually teach the students the, the nuance of that, right? That there's, there's times in studio where you're doing the project and you can kind of like, okay, well, quickly we need to move to the design. Not being able to build, we really focused in and honed in on the, the aspect of engagement and what that really means and, what, and how, you, how you ask questions of a community without leading those questions being leading to a, an answer that you're kind of expecting. Um, which I think was really good for the students. I think we really, you know, I think Sharon and I both, you know, Dr. Sutton and I both um, felt like this was a, it was a real, um, it was a really good exercise. And, and it came, I don't know if having the pandemic, if there wasn't for the pandemic and we couldn't build, that it wouldn't have slowed us down for a moment to kind of think about those things. So I'll just leave that. Anybody else have something to add to that? I'll jump in. Oh, oh, good. Um, I, I'm Jennifer Lewis. I'm at the University of Georgia, and we have programs in landscape architecture and historic preservation and urban planning. And we've done community engagement and service learning for a long time. We're sort of known for working with towns across the state. We are often serving communities that are underserved otherwise that don't have um, planners and preservationists and landscape architects in their communities. So we work with a lot of small towns and we work with a lot of sort of isolated areas. And one of my favorite things to do, we've been doing it for you know almost 30 years at this point is our design charrette program where we will bring students to a small town in Georgia that they otherwise would never have gotten to see and take them down there you know, to help you sort of envision positive change for a community. And this, the best thing is throwing everybody in a van and staying in a hotel, you know, together and eating meals with the community and working shoulder to shoulder around a table, none of which we could do once March 2020 happened. And so that was really hard to, we had a charrette plan that was going to be really good. We were designing, uh, we were using several old buildings in this historic community of Hawkinsville, Georgia. They wanted to attract a brew pub. So there's a lot of research that needed to go into, you know, figuring out what makes a brew pub work, go visit lots of brew pubs, really hard research. Um, so we had done a lot of, you know, a lot of that lead up to it. Everybody was really, really excited about it. It was a great community that's on the river and they weren't, you know, taking advantage of their river resources. And then all of a sudden we had to sort of hit the brakes and figure out how to do it virtually. So we went through the summer kind of researching good best practices on how to do virtual engagement, really tricky with an area that doesn't have great rural broadband access. Um, but what we ended up doing was, uh, I was familiar with this community and my graduate assistant went down there and she was able to photograph the places and take videos and kind of try to capture digitally um, what the place felt like, but we couldn't take our students down there. And so that, that, was, that was hard. That's you know, the lesson that we want to impart to all of them is don't design from far away, go and be with people and see the place firsthand. Um, but one good thing that came out of it that I got some really good information from the National Charette Institute on best practices in virtual engagement. And there was a really wonderful workshop that talked about how if you, and we learn, I think all of us have probably learned this, whether it's parent teacher conferences or something else, if you can take, you can take in a lot more information if you can do it on your own time. And with our charrettes, we 
felt like they were very open and we were inviting people into our storefront studio and everybody was welcome. But if we were holding meetings at 11 o'clock in the morning on a Friday and then expecting people to come at two o'clock on Saturday and then three o'clock on Sunday to see our final presentation, people either may not feel comfortable being in that space because they haven't been involved in civic stuff before or they have a job where they can't get away or they've got a billion things to do on Saturday and they can't come. So our pivoting to a virtual engagement that was really us polishing what would normally have been a very rough midpoint, you know, after 24 hours kind of presentation of stuff, turning that into a voiceover PowerPoint that we could upload to YouTube and then have a um, online survey that would ask people their feedback. It was nothing fancy, but it was certainly fancier than anything technology wise that we had done before. We got, a, we got great feedback. We probably had over a hundred respondents that I don't think we would have had that many people in the room um, had we done it in person. Um, it also ended up being kind of a boon to us that our, for our first sort of uh, feedback loop was during uh, early voting. So everybody was lined up in the courthouse to vote. And so we had all, we had also printed posters and put them all up on the wall. So as they're standing there in line, they can kind of review this material that, that we've put together and click a QR code or, you know, take a little slip of paper that has the link on it and do the survey later. We didn't track it. So I don't know sort of demographically how well we did reaching a wider population but i was i was happy with the with the amount of feedback that we got uh and the content of that feedback too so i have to think that we we reached people that we wouldn't have otherwise thanks jennifer i'll jump in um yeah i think this is a a, a great question we're still in the pandemic and it's crazy to like put myself back into March of 2020 and, you know, how everybody was scrambling. Um, but as uh, Brett and Malika mentioned, um, I help direct engagement for uh, Streetwise, which is a community driven mapping platform um, that we utilize to complement a lot of traditional engagement within design processes. Um, and the focus of using Streetwise is really to think about how participatory technology um, can create that co-design uh, with people on, a, on the ground in ways that Jennifer mentioned of really taking the burden off of having to be somewhere in person um, and kind of rethinking the way that engagement is done in a uh, kind of event based where it's a, a moment in time where you're kind of collecting something and then people leave, uh, but more of an ongoing process where community members are um, mapping and sharing their experiences with other community members about the things that are working in their neighborhood, the things that aren't working in their neighborhood and their ideas for solutions. Um, and that process benefits other community members because it's real time information that people can use. Um, but in a lot of our, our projects, you know, we partner with um, grassroots organizations, small businesses, hospital schools, planners, designers, etc. Um, that kind of two way feedback loop is super critical for design decisions, program decisions, um, development decisions because there's a gap in the data that is commonly used for making those decisions. There are, it's oftentimes really, really big data and not always accurate on the ground level. So that's just the, the value of real-time community-based data. So as we entered the pandemic, um, you know, a lot of our projects were able to continue just because of the nature of the work that we do. Um, but what we found was that it was increasingly harder for folks to be in a virtual space for trainings, right? Like we really, we always try to meet people where they are, but I think that phrase carries a lot more weight in during the pandemic um, when the, your partners that you're working for or working with who are grassroots organizations, they might have shifted their entire 
um, goal of the year and are now focused on like mitigating stress. So really thinking about like, okay, how can we help um, our partners, help people on the ground in ways that are really meeting their needs now? Um, so that's like being able to have the flexibility to kind of shift and pivot to meet people where they are, but also in thinking about um, how we are compensating people for their time. Um, you know, in an engagement, <laughs> compensation is always a, a, a part, right? Like you want to value people for people's times, whether that's through childcare or food or uh, gift cards, um, but you don't want it to be transactional, right? There's th like a value of the relationship that you're building and the connections that you're making. Um, and so that keeping that like honoring that value component and like the the relationship component was really important for us but also just investing more in that compensation like people need <laughs> need uh really like basic needs um and it's important to give so that they can part they can kind of feel comfortable then giving as well right like that's what the the relationship started to kind of a relationship started to shift a little bit to make sure that like we're meeting people where they are and they they have what they need to be able to participate um and then the last thing i'll say is that we created a uh, real-time responsive version of streetwise uh streetwise is usually like a, a private platform that we set up separate accounts for our projects we created a public platform that anybody could use um, and anybody could see and kind of interact with data and stories and find things that they need in a real time way without having to create an account or sign up or anything. And that was really helpful for people, especially um, in those early months, because we were finding that the places that you normally went to for essential needs, you know, things were flying off the shelf, but there were also a lot of community driven pop up places to get the things that you need like churches and schools were popping up as uh, food banks, right? And, you know, city websites weren't always up to date <laughs> with when those things were happening. And so having that real time kind of resource directory that also had community feedback about what they were experiencing um, was really, really helpful. And something that we did in, in terms of our, you know, our work plan essentially was like pivoting and getting that live really, really quickly so that people um, could use that to their benefit. Awesome. Um, so my co-panelists have made so many great points. So I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, from the practice side of the um, design practice side, I think my biggest takeaway as well as what uh, Jennifer, Tessa and Mark have already shared was sort of challenging my own assumptions and others other assumptions about how to engage people and, and what opportunities there are um, to do that effectively. So the example I'll give is a project I did uh, with the university's uh, uh, resource center for LGBTQIA plus and women and femme students. So they had two separate uh, centers for queer students and uh, for women identified students and they wanted to update and combine them so that they're serving all of these populations um, together, uh, especially in terms of, um, you know, acknowledging the many intersections between all of these populations. They're not, you're not gay or a woman, <laughs> for instance. And I found that I, you know, being based in LA and being across the country from this university, I was at first very, um, saddened uh, and I'm sort of leaning in on my own assumptions about how it's supposed to go. You know, I, I we couldn't do these big events uh, where we could invite lots and lots of students and alums to come and do a charrette, uh, that kind of thing. And I, I found myself having um, much longer conversations that went more deeply um, with students and alums over and staff over Zoom where I could show them lots and lots. So it's kind of going right off of what Jennifer you shared and Tessa and Mark you shared, you know, having these much more, uh, um, nuanced conversations. And also the reason why I like this example and want to share it with you all is because it teased apart a lot of the power dynamics that were inherent in these spaces that we wanted to um, disrupt and, and model a new way for. So whether it was um, the kind of uh, incidental um, 
kind of taking up more space of the cis students versus the trans students or white students taking up more space, you know, incidentally, again, often unintentionally uh, than the students of color. These were things that I, I started becoming aware and might not have come out in the same way if we were speaking in larger groups, even if they were small groups. Um, but I was able to kind of share more with each individual person um, about who I am and what my identities are, and then we could talk about it uh, in, in, at, at greater length. And, and I had not, that was a surprise, a pleasant surprise to me as a designer. Um, there's more to say about that, but, but shifting gears a little bit, Mark, I had a really, I've been thinking so much about education as well, both through my work with Dark Matter University, where during the pandemic, we made these huge shifts to using the virtual hybrid and hybrid methods um, to do uh, work across universities. I was co-teaching a class through Dark Matter University that was actually Michigan students and Buffalo students at the same time, um, because we were using that hybrid uh, format. And so um, that was really exciting and something that we'd like to continue because um, it immediately kind of jolted everyone out, changed the shape of the classroom um, and brought in, we were able to bring in like a huge lineup of like 15 guest speakers so that we had one guest speaker every week from all over the country um, and just filled the room, uh, the virtual room with with amazing people. Um, and I, I, I still kind of, I, I'm already feeling a little bit like that moment is passing us by. We're both like still in the pandemic and I'm feeling like, oh, that time. <laughs> Um, but I do think that those reflections I'm still having in the classroom right now. So at USC, right, um, I'm teaching for a partnership that USC has made with LA Unified School District, which is, this, uh, for those who don't know, the second largest public school district in the country after New York. Um, and, you know, there's we originally had set all these metrics and intentions like having a 95% attendance rate, for instance, which is which was very typical, right? Uh, and immediately realized that, that that went out the window. Like there's no way um, the students can make it all that time, both because they're minors and they may not be uh, vaccinated yet, or they have families who are, are um, who have schedules that have been disrupted because of COVID. And so some of my students just come one day and don't come the next uh, by no fault of their own. Um, and so we've had to really, I, I saw in the chat too, Paula wrote slowing down, you know, to echo what Mark's reflection was. I think that that's exactly the biggest takeaway, which is not really a design takeaway. It's sort of a life takeaway, right? Um, slowing down and moving at the speed of um, the communities that we're a part of and working with. Um, I there, There's a line that I keep or a reminder I keep making to myself and people around me, which is just like, if there's an opportunity not to manufacture a sense of urgency, let's take it, right? Because there are truly things that are urgent. <laughs> but if it's not urgent, if we can move the meeting to next week, you know, and give everyone a little breathing room, let's take it. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll pause there and, and, and let the conversation continue. Yeah, so moving along and unfortunately keeping uh, an eye on the time too, I think I'm going to actually try and get the next two questions together so we at least have a way to address both of them. So the, the second question was really, I think we've already been dealing, talking about it because it was more to do with what are some changes you've made in your practice, both personally and organizationally, you know, because of the a time we find ourselves in the pandemic. And the third question is really, what does it reveal about design as a profession? So what you've, you know, this moment and, you know, and the role that engaged designers and the future of engaged design practice to be. So again, I'll open this up, anybody jump in and I saw some of your work kind of using the chat to see, so that's great. I think that's interesting. It's something that uh, we've all, I bet, wanted to keep in the forefront of our minds as this pandemic um, continues. Some people think it's over, some it's not. Um, but the we started a lot of our meetings um, early on as, as we had sort of been in it for the long haul by asking each other, what is something that you want to keep as a result of the pandemic? Um, what is something good that came out of it, which is a nice way to put a positive spin on it, but also to make sure that we don't forget any good lessons that we've learned and just fall back on doing things the way that we've always done them. Um, 
at the University of Georgia, we, I believe, had a pretty good COVID policy and some safety measures in place that politically have gone out the window once this fall semester started. So there's a lot of assumption um, by our governing bodies that everything should be back to normal. And so we also have a lot of communities that we work with that also think the pandemic is over and are expecting things to just be, you know, as, as they were. And why would you need to make any particular modifications? So the challenge that we have this um, semester is working with the community, one of those uh, communities, uh, and planning a charrette that feels a little bit more like the ones we've always done and yet wanting to be safe. Uh, and maybe even if our community partner doesn't think that's necessary, um, but also take advantage of the lessons, uh, the good things that have come out of having to do our charrettes virtually, for example. So one of the take, the biggest takeaway that we had that I've been challenged of figuring out how to, how to keep um, is that it's so much easier for folks to engage if they are given, let's say, a week of public engagement, kind of like you said, BZ, about, um, you know, uh, or, or maybe it was what uh, Tessa had said about um, wanting to have people to kind of do it on their own time and be able to come to the conversation, not at a particular slice in time, but to, to chime in whenever they are available, even if it's one o'clock in the morning from the bed on their phone, but you can still weigh in on this you know, community project. And so that's what we're doing with an upcoming project is we are visiting the community so the students can see it, they can experience it. We are asking that they be masked and we're eating meals that we're sharing together outside, which luckily we have the weather to be able to do that for a longer period of time than others. Um, and we're meeting with a smaller group of stakeholders, not a giant community meeting. Um, so we're saving that in-person um, visibility uh, and that participatory part for a core group, but then we're still doing our virtual, our in public input virtually with, you know, giving it about, you know, a week and a half or two weeks in between for that feed loop, feedback loop process. And I can't, I can't imagine now going back to trying to cram in everything in a three-day weekend. It's, it's, there's so many good things that come out of having that breathing room, you know, emotionally, physically, but also just to sort of let, you know, there's, there's a lot of benefit to a charrette and cramming it all in and doing everything together and everybody clearing everything else off their table. Um, but maybe that was an unrealistic expectation, you know? So that's, that's the changes that I think we'll, we'll keep making. Yeah, that's such a good point, Jennifer. And I resonate with that because I, all of our trainings are virtual now. And there's parts of me that are like, oh, I miss being able to like go to a community and train people in person and actually like see what they're doing and support them. And there's that like connection that you have, um, which is great. But I think the pandemic also, benefits of the pandemic have helped us, okay, think about how to support just like tech literacy in general within our training. So like if people aren't comfortable with Zoom or, you know, kind of getting people to a virtual training, like sometimes that requires some additional like tech literacy support. And that's good. Like overall, <laughs> that's something that is good to invest time in. Um, and I think is a good thing to like buffer into your work. So I feel like that's a positive. Um, but then a lot, another thing that I keep thinking about is like compassion. Like so many of our funders are so much more compassionate now um, in terms of being less like deliverable and profit driven um, and more um, flexible with like what you're learning um, and how you are proving that the investment they made was worthwhile. Um, because I think I think it's always it's like kind of a tricky balance when you're doing community engagement and you know that on the ground, like so many things can change. Uh, but in the back of your mind, you also have deliverables that you have to meet for a goal and you have a funder or somebody who's kind of like, you know, looking and like making sure that things are on track, right? Um, but so like, Mer connecting those two 
a little bit more, I feel like, has happened during the pandemic because people are so much more compassionate to what people on the ground are experiencing um, and the changes that happen. I mean, you can have a one year long project or multi year, like think about there's so much change that can happen in a year of people coming into a process, coming out of a process, having to shift their focus because they're focused on housing or food or like all of these other critical needs. Um, and I feel like one good thing about the pandemic is people reorienting themselves around compassion in this work, um, which I think is a good thing. Um, I guess there, there's a couple of things I'll say, I guess, personally. Um, one, I, I, I forgot earlier to say with the project we did in Atlanta that um, we worked with um, a friend, Ruth Dussault, who teaches at, um, at Spelman. And so we worked with Spelman and Morehouse students, and they actually did some of the work on the ground to actually help feed information about the community to our students because they couldn't travel to go there, um, which was sort of a part of all of this. And so it was, I think it was, it was actually interesting because then it becomes about how you then translate or understand what some of the circumstances are on the ground as they're being told to you sort of secondhand. Right. And so the conversations then that you have about that to sort of pull out information. Um, so out of that, I'll say one point is that um, I and and I think BZ raised a good point about is like about networks, right? Dark matter um, about this moment of being able to like, I feel like even more so we're like, how can you put these things together or how can I now like, oh, I'm not, the technology kind of helps me. I can sort of like get these groups together to talk or like we can all sort of be in a room and we can all have a conversation. And so I found more a growing network of like, I've, I always was sort of interested in like, oh, I want to put these groups together and see like what comes out of that. Ooh, that could be kind of interesting, you know? And now it's like, it's no longer just sort of a passing thought. It's like, I'm going to put these groups together and I'm going to see if I can get them and see what's going to come out of that and what's going to happen. Those are like, I think those are really good things and they've sort of sparked for me, um, you know, uh, a growth in terms of the things, that, you know, tr trying to explore interests that I have. And so, um, and I'll say that in a selfish way, but also, also I think also it, it, it benefits, I think, all of those involved. And so part of that too is the, my sort of second point is that, um, you know, I've always been sort of committed to sort of the idea of like, you know, I explored the idea of like, what is black design? What is African-American? What is, you know, like, even as, you know, as a graduate student in my thesis, you know, and always had an interest in African-American history and all that and never, you know, that's over here. And then I'm doing this stuff here practice and all of that and in this moment especially you know goes without saying with that after george floyd i think i recommitted myself to be you know what i actually see need to see how these things sort of come together um and and, and really voice that it's important that you know design can there are all these influences we talk about it in other areas like in music and culture and the you know, and it's not like design is sort of like, oh, it's something over here that's like, you know. Um, so really I've tried to bring that interest into like, you know, I'm working with, um, when I talked about black urban farmers or black farmers really in general. And so that's been something that's been of interest in terms of putting groups together. And I feel a relationship to that because, you know, black architects make up like less than 2% of, all registered architects. Um, black farmers are about 1.3% of all farmers in this country, whereas in the early 20th century, they were somewhere between 15 and 20%. You know, why is that? <laughs> like, let's explore that. Let's talk about what the, the reasons are for that. And if people are trying to 
you know, they're farmers and they're trying to succeed in that space. How can I, how can we help? And so that's something that's, you know, there are things like that that have sort of um, happened in this moment that personally I try to carry on. And I, I, I think it was just said earlier about like, you just, I think Tess, I think you said about that moment where you feel like you're sort of in it, but it's like, it's, it's so, you know, is that I, I really don't want that window to close. I'm like, I'm trying so hard to keep it open because I, and the people still um, understand that these are issues and things that we have and that they're not somehow resolved or solved so quickly. Just because we raise them doesn't mean they're done. Oh, so well said. <laughs> thanks, Mark. And thanks, Jennifer and Tessa. Um, yeah, I, I just have a few other points to tack on to what's been said. I think, you know, the, the, the one I'll start with is just that once we know, we can't unknow. And I think that, you know, everyone on this call is probably familiar with an excuse being made like, oh, we don't know any women architects. We don't know any black architects. We don't know anyone who's da, 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 whatever. And we know, <laughs> we know that people are out here. We know that the numbers are awful. We know what needs to be done. And so I think um, that has been something that's been heartening for me um, to see that the conversations move beyond like, let's discuss that there's a problem or is there a problem? You know, I feel like we've been years and years and years of some rehashing of, is there a problem? Um, are there problems? And there are many, many problems. <laughs> so I, I, um, I love to be part of spaces where we're actually identifying or giving examples to each other or sharing those, um, those networks of, of what are simple steps we can take? I think, you know, challenge, I, I've heard a lot of people in the design field kind of have this conversation of challenging ourselves and challenging the people around us, whether it's our, you know, um, our coworkers or uh, colleagues uh, at, at a university or our students or peers of just saying like, no, like, let's try again. Let's like, let's look again and see if there's, we find somebody, right? Because that person is probably there or let's look again and not say that there's no clients who care about this, like there, or there's no one values aligned. Or another example that I had recently was I was speaking with a friend who's just gone back to, to school um, during the pandemic. And I, we were talking and after a while I said, Oh, you know, that's interesting. Did um, would you believe that when I was in grad school for architecture, we didn't go to other schools' lectures? Like we just went to our own schools' lectures and saw whoever our school invited, and that was it. We didn't have the option to like because they were they were saying something like, "Oh, I want to go to MIT's talk," and that, but I want you know, but it's at the same time as like UGA or you know or something like that. And I was like, "Wow, that's." just blown open and we've kind of all accepted it and we we're not going we're not really going back you know even I've seen I'm seeing universities make that choice where they'll even when they have it in person they'll broadcast it now um so we can't I, I actually I'm saying that in an optimistic way I actually think there's a lot that we can't backslide um because pe we, people know um I think in terms of the question of what what's changed for me a lot of it has been about the two words that um come to mind our collectivity and like relationships. So work I've my practice has moved a lot from um uh from just something that I'm trying to do where I am to exactly what Mark and others were uh describing, which is not being less focused on or not being less sighted or grounded, but seeing myself more in relation to um folks doing the same type of work across the country. And I think that's been super powerful. Even, I mean, I think we're modeling it right now. Um, you know, so none of us are losing um, that, that location of where we are and the work that we do in the communities that are here. That's not what any of us is saying, but being able to compare notes and understand that we're each moving the dial forward a little bit where we are. And I think that, that you know, that's all we can do. Um, anyway as individuals and it's and, and then when we add each step that we take all all together that's the power of, of um that's the collective power um i had one more thing to do oh okay yeah so malika's question about what our professional organizations should do and how we should push them i think it's just you know it's, obviously there's not an easy silver bullet here but one of the the collective practices that I've been so lucky to be a part of is the Design is Protest Collective. And so through that collective, we've been, you know, we've been naming um, 
we actually pub self published an entire uh, index that's of what institutions, professional practices, universities, uh, nonprofit organizations can do to move the dial. So you can look at your uh, whatever entity you are online, and I can drop the link in the chat and actually think about, and I've used this myself, um, how to move towards um, an anti-racist practice. So uh, for, uh, just to give one example, as a teacher, you know, there are examples that we've co-written and published about how you could uh, audit your own syllabus, for instance, and look for uh, ways to make your class more accessible, or if you're a firm, um, how you can um, kind of level the playing field for entry level folks coming in. So I'll drop that chat in, uh, I'll drop that link in the chat. Great. Uh, Brett, did you want to, should we move to it? We are at five my time, <laughs> the East Coast. So move to a breakout session and talk a little bit about the concept more. Exactly. So I'm going to put the link to the concept board in the chat. Um, and actually also just thank so much thanks to all the panelists for the incredibly thoughtful responses. It's really um, just so amazing to hear um, the, you know, just variety of responses. Um, so thank you. Uh, so I will explain um, um, how the concept board will work. And as Malika said, we'll do three breakout room. So let me share my screen for a second. Um, bring up the concept board and share my screen. And I suspect folks are some folks who have been using concept board are, are maybe already on the concept board. Um, but again, essentially, we'll have um, three breakout rooms. Um, and the first breakout room will really the, the focus could be question one, but but obviously you have the whole you know concept board here so if you have feedback you want to put on um you know the second one or the third one please feel free um but the idea really is just that we have some time because we we know that the folks here are all or or many of them are you know designers and working in a community engaged uh realm and so um we just really hope to get kind of feedback that we can continue to share with folks um in the future. So the idea is, and again, if you haven't used concept board, um, essentially you have these uh, sticky notes so you can go in and um, put um, your note and you can type in uh, your response to the question. And again, I think I see folks already doing that. I'm gonna delete this note, um, but um, is there, does, does that make sense to folks? Um, so I'm going to stop the share and um, people can kind of go in on their own to the concept board. Uh, and I think um, Aaron will be making the breakout rooms and I think we'll be kind of random breakout rooms. Uh, I, I was enjoying that last thing you were saying, Tessa. <laughs> yeah, and we got all pushed out too. I think everybody had the same response, so. So is everybody back? I think, do we have another group coming in? I think maybe everyone's back. So I think what the way we had imagined it is we would spend the last few uh, uh, minutes, 10 minutes or five minutes uh, to getting a sense of next steps, because what are some things and we do have, we do have the board, which we'll be able to collate. And uh, I think um, we can have, if you would drop your email addresses in the chat, we will collect that. And what we would like 
to happen is that this not be a conversation in itself, and we have this and it ends here, but at least take small steps, recognizing that a lot of us are doing a lot of things. So uh, in that context, if uh, you all have any thoughts on what you think would be meaningful next steps and in what way can COPED as a platform, you know, help some of this effort, you know, move on to the next step. So I'd just like kind of open it up for that conversation. You could also put things on the chat because Zoom, this is the kind of an awkward thing, like who's gonna talk first? I also just wanna say we, um, in our group started to um, just have a, a chance to talk about the question that came up in the chat earlier around, um, you know, how do you do community engagement in rural areas? And I, I think it, you know, it, even though, you know, we're in an urban area here, some of the, some of the places uh, are very dispersed and aren't necessarily connected, you know, in the same like school district, for example, like some things, you know, cut across many places. And, um, we, we kind of just just the moment when Tessa, I think, was 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 um, kind of responding to the question. And um, one of the things I, I know she was talking about was like, sometimes it's just about that, like, I don't know, I, I don't even want to I don't want to speak for you. Do you want to do you want to no, finish what you were saying? Sure. I also put it in the chat. I was just saying um, that sometimes like there are networks in rural areas, but they're less visible because the space is, it's they're more spread out um, and they might happen like once a week, like I'm thinking about like uh, faith based networks um, and they're harder to tap probably and take a, a, a lot of like community building and trust building, um, but sometimes it, it just kind of takes that upfront work um, to like make those connections and relationships and understand the networks in the in the in the area but i was also going to say that um also developing tools to help people connect to one another um remotely if there is broadband access is also helpful so people don't have to be in the same place because they might be spread out but they can still connect with one another and the third thing i was going to say was that I also think it's about uh, kind of reframing um, that oh, you need a lot of data points to be successful with um, kind of identifying, OK, we should move in this direction or, you know, we, we often think like the quantity of something means success and instead sort of reframing that to really valuing like the input that people are sharing. Um, I think those things have been helpful for us in the work that we've done in rural spaces. And I had put my response to you, Alexandra, in the chat also. Um, I don't, we were able to really lean on our cooperative extension agents in Georgia because there's one in every county and they are so embedded in all kinds of aspects of not just ag, but 4-H and family consumer sciences. And they, they have established networks and relationships in those rural counties already. So we, you know, leaned into our partnership more with them, but also relied on them to let us know what maybe would and wouldn't work. Um, we also were very intentional at making sure that any kind of presentation or information that we wanted to get out to folks, we use the big evil Facebook because everybody's on Facebook. And if you, even if you don't have really good Wi-Fi access at home uh, on your laptop or a computer, you probably got a cell phone and you probably have a Facebook app on there. And so using those networks um, and then all the other groups that people might already be a part of, uh, I think is what helped us be able to get a good response rate from folks as we were we were meeting them where they were. Um, I'm curious if there's other questions that folks just want to you know, posed to the group that maybe um, I haven't had time to go th so much through the chat, but if there are other questions that maybe we missed that um, anyone would want to have some last reflections on. I'd, I'd love to pick up on what um, what I think Alexandra just wrote in the uh, 
uh, about gaining trust. And it's it's interesting because I think there are organizations I'm working with that a lot of the conversations we have is like, let's not replicate those sort of intentions of the past of like, we're going to, hi, I'm from the government and I'm going to, I'm here to fix stuff. You know, it's like, or hi, I'm from this organization and I'm, I've got money in a bag and I'm going to fix that. It's like, you really want to, it, it can't be said enough of meeting people where they are and looking for also um, I guess programs and things that actually try to bring people together. Um, it's been said before through different organizations where, where there's already a, a sense of trust and actually understanding like trying to speak to the things that you're trying to bring and do. Um, I know I was gonna mention USDA had a program where I was talking about working with you know, urban farmers. There's been a push to sort of put these sort of urban farmers with rural farmers and actually create a network um, so that there's a connection there, especially in this, you know, given the political climate too, where people can be very separate, but they can actually meet over things that are common to them. Are any of you, all, we have also the list of, you know, uh, on the concept board, we had all the list of, you know, dark matter university and all those other groups and collectives. So uh, please take a moment and put that because then we already, we don't, you know, have this, we'll put it up on a COPED platform. So people who are looking for uh, finding networks of like-minded people, they can actually do that. Uh, I know we are, we have two more minutes. So Brett, I'm going to let you say a few words because at 5.30, we will be pushed out, so. Um, well, I, I guess I would just like to thank um, everyone. I mean, uh, both the panelists, the amazing insights, um, and really just appreciate the work they're doing. Um, I think we, we look to the work that you're doing as inspiration, and, um, and uh, it's really great to hear, you know, some of the issues around your work that's both inspiring you um, and, and challenging you. So thank you for, um, yeah, the amazing feedback and, and, uh, also everyone for joining. And I also want to thank, um, Nan, who, um, has been the, the kind of intern for COPED over the last year and has just done amazing work. Um, and also we, we, we had a couple of interns at, at UC Davis, um, Amma and Genevieve who really, um, did amazing work and, and though they graduated and aren't with us today, um, really none of this could have happened without them. So, yeah. I think that, Thank that's you it. again, um, everybody. It yeah. was a pleasure to connect with all of you. And again, because of this format, we could do this with so many people across so many different states, so. And Malika, I'd love to thank you and Brett uh, for, for today's session and Tessa, Mark, Jennifer, Nan, these, all of you um, collectively and our participants for this incredibly rich conversation. We are taking a one hour break before our Thursday evening plenary channels, which begins at 3.30 Pacific time, 6.30 Eastern time. We are dropping in the link, the chat, uh, in the chat at the link for details on how to join um, both this tonight's session and future sessions for tomorrow. So again, thank you all. And uh, we hope to see you later this evening.